This teaching is about the people of Israel crossing the Jordan River and setting up 12 memorial stones in Joshua chapters 3 and 4. Welcome to the Christian Bro Code YouTube channel. I'm your bro, Dr. Mario Escobedo. If you're a regular here, thank you so much for coming back. And if you're new, welcome. I hope you'll consider subscribing. This channel is all about your growth. Let's get into the teaching. Now, as I like to do before I dive into the passage, I like to set it up with some context. So let's look at some context for Joshua chapters 3 and 4. By this point, we're talking about the history of Israel, the nation of Israel. By this point, Moses had died. Moses had been Israel's leader for quite some time by this point. He's died, and now Joshua is the new leader for the nation of Israel. The people of Israel at this point in the story or in their history, they find themselves on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Let me pull up a map so you can get a better idea of what that means. Now, here's a map of the ancient Near East. When we talk about Old Testament geography and politics, typically we refer to this region as the ancient Near East. Now, look at this. Here we have Egypt way over here. The length of the Nile River is essentially Egypt. The Delta region up here in the north, that's where the people of Israel would have been in slavery. Then the Sinai Desert right here, that's where they would have wandered for 40 years. And now under the leadership of Joshua, they find themselves right about here on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Let me zoom in so you can get a better picture of that. So this is that area zoomed in just north of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is this area right here, that body of water, lowest place on the face of the earth. And the people of Israel would have been camped somewhere around here. We can't be exact about it, but we know that that that's where they were. This area right here, that's the Jordan River. It's in the Jordan Rift or the Jordan Valley. And on this side, this is the promised land. For all intents and purposes, this is the promised land. The people of Israel are on this side. And now what they need to do is they need to cross over to the western side of the promised land or the Jordan River in order to inherit and take possession of the promised land. Now, let's start reading in Joshua chapter 3 so that we can get into the story about them crossing the river and then the whole idea of then setting up 12 memorial stones. This is, uh, this is how Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 7, this is how it reads. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. Now that was key, that was important. Joshua's taking over Israel's only and most significant leader up to that point. And so now Moses is gone and Joshua has to fill his shoes. How's he going to do that? Are the people going to receive him? Well, the Lord has a solution for that. He's going to do something to demonstrate to the people of Israel that Joshua was indeed the selected individual to lead the people of Israel. Verse eight, tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. So those are the instructions to the priests and to the people of Israel. Look at what happens next. We're going to jump down to verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now we're going to look at verse 15. There's some important information. It may not seem important at first, but it is. Check it out. Verse 15. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, we saw that on the map just a little bit ago, was completely cut off so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Now, before we move on, let me point out some things here. Number one, it's interesting that it notes that the Jordan is at flood stage during all harvest. This is important. This is an important detail because because what it lets us know is the following, that when the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River, it wasn't at a time when the river was shallow. The water was significantly deep. If it's during the flood season, it means that the Jordan River wasn't just deep. It means that more than likely the water was overflowing. It was coming out over the, the, the edge or the bank of the river. So we're not talking about water that was ankle deep, maybe not even knee deep or waist deep. We're talking about water that was significantly deep. As far as rivers go, it was deep because it was during the season of flood stage. So we know that we're talking about some pretty deep water at this point. We also have some geographic reference points uh, of where the water was cut off and where it stopped flowing to. So let's see that on the map. It mentions that verse that we just read. It mentions Adam, which is about 
15 miles or so north of where the people of Israel would have crossed. That's where the water was piled up. That's where it stopped. So there was a, a significant distance between where the people of Israel were and where the water started to pile up. And then it says that it cut off all pretty much from Adam all the way down to the Dead Sea. There was no longer a flow of the water. So those are important details to note. Most significantly for me, and I'm going to I'm going to come back to this when we talk about the 12 memorial stones is the depth of the water. I, I think that's an important clue. And there's it's just not coincidental that the Bible included that detail. So let, let's go on. We're going to read now in verse 17. We're getting, we're getting to the crossing and to the, the point of why these memorial stones. So this is what verse 17 says. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now, for sure, this is almost like a flashback to the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea. Notice how God said, I'm going to do something, Joshua, so that the people of Israel will know that I've chosen you. There's not going to be any doubt. And so it's interesting that for Moses, a significant, a watershed moment for Moses was the parting of the Red Sea. Well, God is doing something very similar here, not identical, but very similar with Joshua. And that was definitely intentional on God's part so that the people of Israel would recognize, wow, this is really, really similar to what happened with Moses. This guy is definitely God's chosen because who else does this? I mean, who does that? Who's able to stop water under whose leadership does that happen? What happened under Moses and now it's happening under Joshua. So that's a significant deal that uh, detail that takes place there. So the water stops and the people of Israel are able to cross over on dry land. Now we're going to jump over to chapter four. Okay. Here's, where we're going to start talking about those memorial stones. Chapter four, starting in verse four. Here's how it reads. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. He had done that previously, but he didn't tell them what he was going to use them for. And then in verse five, and he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord, your God into the middle of the Jordan. So the priests, after all the nation has crossed, the priests are still standing in the middle of the riverbed where the Jordan water had stopped. The waters of the Jordan had stopped. So he tells these 12 men, go over there to the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. Let me pause there because look at what the, the little detail that's included there, that it says that each of you should take up a stone and then where is it and put it on his shoulders. So we're not talking about a grapefruit size stone. We're not talking about something the size of a softball or the size of a baseball. We're talking about something that was big enough and heavy enough to have to hoist onto a shoulder. We're not talking about something the size of, uh, you know, the, the huge rocks that we see at Stonehenge, for example. Not that big, but we're not talking about something small either. It was something big enough that it to be carried needed to be hoisted onto the shoulders of these men carried out from the middle of the water over to where they were. And that's what they're going to do. And, and you've got 12 men, one of them representing each of the tribes uh, of Israel. So this is what Joshua instructed them to do. And what's interesting, notice right there at the very end, that this was to serve as a sign among you. And in the, in the, the second part of verse 6, we're going to discover exactly what that sign is for. Look at what this says. In the future, now here's the sign. Here's the significance of these memorial stones and the sign. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. All right, now here's, here's the payoff. Here's what we're, we're getting to about these memorial stones. I want you to picture this, uh, this portion of the passage from the perspective of the children who are asking, what do these stones mean? Because imagine this, you're walking with your kids by the side of the Jordan River, and all of a sudden you see this pile or this arrangement of 12 pretty large stones, and the kids will say, wow, well, well, what do these stones mean? And this is an opportunity for the parents to start into that conversation of what those stones mean. And here's, I'm imagining what the conversation may have looked like. Well, those 12 stones came from the middle of the Jordan River. And I think the kid's reaction may have been something like, what? That's impossible. Like, there's no man who is strong enough who can jump into the Jordan River, 
go down to the bottom where the stones are, these big stones would have been, in water, underwater, pick up a stone, be able to swim back up to the surface, and then take the stone to the edge of the riverbank. That's, that's impossible. And then, I mean, not just take into consideration, no one can do that underwater, hold your breath that long, pick up a stone underwater, it's going to weigh you down. And then what about the flow, the current of the river? I mean, I mean Dad, okay, like you've told me some pretty incredible stuff before, but this takes the cake. How in the world are you telling me that these 12 big stones were taken from the middle, from the floor of the river Jordan? How, that doesn't make any sense. And here's the opportunity for the dad, for the mom, for the parents to talk about what God had done. And so when the kids are questioning or asking, how, how is it possible? It's impossible that these came from the floor, the, the riverbed of the Jordan River. That, that couldn't have happened. Oh, wait, I left out a little detail. You see, what happened is that the water of the Jordan River stopped flowing. See, when the, the priests came with the Ark of the Covenant and they stepped in the water, it stopped flowing. Now, you're too young to remember this, or maybe you weren't even born when this happened, but I saw this with my own eyes. We all crossed from that side of the Jordan to this side of the Jordan on dry ground. And when the water was still stopped, Joshua sent 12 men to pick up these heavy stones from the bottom of the riverbed and bring them to the bank of the river or bring them back to our camp. That's how it happened. See, this was an opportunity, two things. Number one, for the people of Israel to remember, because that's what God said. This is to serve as a memorial to the people of Israel forever. This is something, these stones served to remind the people of Israel of this miraculous occurrence of how God crossed them over to the promised land so that they could start taking possession of the promised land. So this was huge. It was a reminder for those who were there and for future generations of what God had done. But I also see this as a conversation starter. It was an opportunity for parents to tell their kids about the miraculous deeds of God and how he brought the people of Israel into the promised land. It was a conversation starter. Yeah, it was for them to remember and for generations beyond them to remember. But anytime they would have walked by the banks of the Jordan or the camp where they set these up and they would have seen those stones, it was a conversation starter. Dad, what do those mean? Mom, what do those mean? And that's where they would have said, well, let me tell you what God did. And so a reminder and a conversation starter. And what, what does that mean for us now today? I think we need some memorial stones. And I'll say that in quotes. We need some memorial stones. Objects or things that will remind us of what God has done in our past. Now, understand me. I'm not talking about idols. I'm, don't, don't misinterpret me. I'm not talking about things that we would worship or venerate. No, not at all. That's not what these stones were for. I'm talking about things that remind us of what God has done for us in the past. Let me give you an example. Uh, my sister-in-law, she's my, my wife's sister. She has a set of glasses in her house, she and her husband. And in fact, here's, here's a picture of these glasses. This family, my sister-in-law and her husband, they've had these glasses for at least 30 years, at least 30 years, okay? And you see those glasses and there's, I mean, they're, they're nice glasses, there's nothing wrong with them, but to hang on to a, a set of glasses for 30 years, drinking glasses for 30 years, that, that's pretty incredible, but there's a reason behind it. Now, I don't know if you can see, but these glasses are from Whataburger. Whataburger is a, uh, a hamburger chain, a restaurant of, of a hamburger chain here in Texas. And so as I asked them about this, why do you have these glasses and why have you had them here for so long? They're in their cupboard. They're not stored away in the garage anywhere. No, they're, like, they're in their primary cupboard, in their pantry. And they said, well, here's what it is. When we were first married, we couldn't afford to buy drinking glasses. And so at that time, there was a promotion being run by Whataburger. And if you would buy a meal or a hamburger, you would get a free glass. And so they were telling us what we had to do because money was so tight. What we would have to do is that we would go to Whataburger. We couldn't buy drinking glasses of our own. So we would buy a meal. We would split the meal between us. That's how, that's how bad things were economically. We needed to split the meal between us. And we would buy the meal, we would share it, but we would get a drinking glass. And little by little, we went creating our set of drinking glasses. And they would tell us, we, we kept these glasses or we've kept these glasses for so long 
to remind us of God's faithfulness, to remind us that even in those times when stuff was really tight, financially speaking, when it was just really tough, God didn't abandon us. God remained faithful. God continued to provide. And yeah, it reminds us of the testing of our faith and how we had to trust in God during that time. That's why we keep these drinking glasses around. I I heard that the first time I heard, and I've heard them tell us that several times, but the first time I heard that I was blown away. And I have to imagine that at several points in those 30 years, their kids have probably told them something like, why do we still have those glasses? Shouldn't we buy some new drinking glasses? Why are we hanging on to them? And it serves as a conversation starter. For sure, it reminds the, the parents, the grownups of why they have those drinking glasses, but it also serves as an opportunity for them to tell their kids, let us tell you why we still have those drinking glasses. It's a memorial stone. It's an opportunity for them to share with their kids and now their grandkids, because they still have them and their grandkids see those glasses. It's an opportunity for them to share with their kids and their grandkids what God has done and how they continue to, how they can continue to trust that God will continue to provide and God will continue to be faithful. Why do we know that? Well, it's a reminder that we, we have these memorial stones. We have these things to remind us of God's faithfulness in the past and that he will continue to be faithful for us in the future. And so I want to ask you this question. You can, or rather, I want to, I want to leave this big idea with you. You can use memorial stones. And I say that in quotes, you can use memorial stones to talk to your family about what God has done in your life. Undoubtedly, God has done some pretty incredible things in your life. And I'm sure that you have something, you've hung on to something that reminds you of what God has done in your life. My wife and I, we have those things around our house as well that remind us of God's faithfulness when I was growing up or when she was growing up or in the time that we've been married. And we use those opportunities or those objects as, quote, memorial stones to talk to our daughters about God's faithfulness about how God has provided time and time again throughout our years. And undoubtedly, you have stories and experiences of what God has done in your life and how God has demonstrated himself faithful in your life. Have you taken the opportunity to share those stories with your kids? Have you brought that object out and maybe shown it to your kids and said, hey, kids, you know what this is? Oh, dad, why do you still have that? I mean, why are you still hanging on to that, dad? I mean, get rid of that. It's old. It's ratty. It's whatever it might be. But you take that opportunity and you say, let me tell you why I'm still hanging on to this. And you tell them the story. It serves as a reminder for you. And it serves as a a starter, a, a conversation starter, so that you can tell your kids about how God has been faithful in your life. You can use, quote, memorial stones to talk to your family about what God has done in your life. And so I want to end with, uh, with this question. Do you have an object that you hang on to because it's a reminder of something God did in your life? I'm not talking about something again. It's not an idol. It's not a talisman. It's not anything of that sort. It's something that you hang on to because it reminds you of God's faithfulness. Do you have something like that? I know I do. My wife and I, we do. Do you have something like that? If so, let me know in the comments, tell me, tell me what that is, what that means to you and, and how it reminds you of how God has been faithful and Start considering how you can use that as a conversation starter for your kids. Hey, there are a whole lot more teachings just like this one here on the Christian Bro Code YouTube channel. First thing I'd love to invite you to do is tap on the button below to subscribe. That way you never miss out on the new teachings. Also, check out over there on the side of the screen. Those are some teachings you can access right now. I know that they will help you learn and they will help you to keep growing. Until next time, God bless, bro.